So hello and a very warm welcome to St Catherine's and our morning service. Uh, you're really, really welcome and really, really wanted here, uh, whether you've been coming every week uh, since we've been allowed to open or whether you're just venturing back for the first time. You're very, very welcome and it's great to see so many people here. Uh, this morning's service, we're calling it a non-traditional communion service, which means we'll be sharing communion, but the liturgy uh, might look a bit different. It might be new to some of you, or it might be quite familiar to others. Um, but wherever you come to this liturgy from, we hope it speaks to you um, and it helps you to encounter God. Uh, so we're going to start with our welcome. Uh, so, are you ready to meet God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We ready. And we say together, Heavenly Father, open our ears to hear you. Open our eyes to see your image in everyone gathered here. Open our arms to include everyone. Open our minds to understand your word. Open our mouths to sing your praise. Open our hearts to receive your Son, Jesus, as our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So if you would like to stand, if you're able, we are going to sing our opening three songs. They'll all be on the screen, uh, but they're also in the books if you need them. And Tony will... No, the, they're not all in the books. Oh, they're not all in the books. <laughs> the first three will be.
certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then Paul lists a whole load of people. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, all the way down. And at the end, he says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And those words come out in this next song, by faith.
do piece it out. To be completely honest with you, we are now hitting a point in the service that I've been dreading uh, because we're about to see a video, uh, and this is a video I recorded about 15 years ago when I was uh, young and fresh-faced and I'd just come back from a sales training uh, at work. So I'm going to be slightly mortified as we watch this, but I offer it to you in a spirit of sacrificial worship uh, because I hope it might help get us to start thinking about the theme of our service, which is how we share our faith. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to hide down here. Dot, hi, Raj here. Yeah, it's a bear market. Rub. Yeah, call me. We'll do lunch. Bye. Oh, hello there. Uh, my name's Dr. Roger McAllister Smythe, MBE, and I work for the post office. I'm a sales guru. That means I'm very good at sales. Look at my jacket. Nice. I'm here today to talk to you about sales and how we can make them. I'll be explaining this through four scenarios in which I will use my good friend Elizabeth Parker Bigglesmade. Okay, we will start with scenario one. Hello there. Hello. What can I do for you? Um, I'd like to buy a book of first class stamps, please. Certainly, madam. There you are. That'll be £3.84, please. Oh, that's perfect. Just right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just before you go, yes. can I ask you, do you use a credit card at all? I do, actually, yes. Uh, which card do you use? A Barclay card. Barclay card? Yes. Seriously, you use Barclay cards? Yes. Are you insane? 16.9% interest, they charge. 16.9. Do you know how much the post office is? 13.9%. That's 3% less. That's just insane. What kind of a moron would get a Barclay card? You just... Oh, oh, oh. When you go abroad, do you know you have to pay to use it? What, what kind of map here? We're trying to use Barclay Card abroad. Oh, you, you've got to cut it up. Look, seriously, go home, cut it up, throw it away, get a post office one. Because if you don't, you really have to open yourself to the possibility that you might be a soldier for Beelzebub. Now get out of my office before I go insane. I spit on Barclay Card. <laughs> Hello. Hello. What can I do for you? Um, I'd like to buy a book of first class stamps, please. Yes, yeah, so anyway, but before I get you those stamps, can I just ask you, do you use a credit card at all? Um, no, I don't actually, uh, but to be honest, I, I just need my stamps. Because the thing with the post office credit card is that it's 0% on balance transfers for eight months. Um, I, I, really, I don't really need a credit card, I just need and, stamps. That's and the other thing with it is you can actually use it abroad for free. Look, I really can't talk about this right now. I've, I've, I'm, I'm late, late for a meeting, I just need my stamps. And there's 0% like, on purchases for three months. But I'm not going to say that. Actually, please, you, I just need my stamps. Yeah, well, we'll do your stamps in a minute. Yeah. Chill out, okay? Just before... I'm sorry, no. I can't chat. I can't no, just, chat. Okay, you actually won an award recently for being the best credit card. But, but I just need stamps. Please look, I've got money. Please just stamps. No, I need to talk to you about the credit card. Okay, I'm going to spit. Hmm. Some people are just so uptight, aren't they? Have you ever seen anyone using this approach to sharing their faith? He's a 
crazy guy, isn't he? I wonder what happens in scenario three. Hello there. Hello. What can I do for you? Um, I'd like to buy a book of first class stamps, please. Suppose, uh, that'll be £3.84, please. Okay. Should do it. Cheers, thank you. There are your stamps. Before you go, I've got to ask you to use a credit card. Oh, uh, yes, I do. Yeah, and the thing is the post office offers one. Do you, you don't want one, do you? Um, I don't know what, what, what's the, what kind of deals do they offer, what is it, is it, is it, it a good deal? It, it's a credit card, you know, they, they do stuff, you buy things with it, it's... Do, you have, do they have um, a leg of time where it's not spent on balance transfers at all, or...? Yeah, definitely. Can you use it abroad? Yeah, yeah, you can is use it abroad. Are there charges for that? Um, yeah, just, just a minute, can you just hang on there for a minute? Justine, did you see that thing on telly last night? Yeah, it was really good, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, excuse me, you, you're telling me about the... Christine, I've got a customer. I'll, I'll get back to you in a minute. Okay, sorry, what was it you wanted? Uh, you were telling me about the credit card. The credit card? Oh, yeah, the credit, it's a credit card. It's from, it's from the post office. Is, is it much hassle to change it to swap the balance over from another? You know what, I think I'll just stick with my Barclay card. Would you buy a credit card from someone who was this disinterested? Have you ever seen anyone talk about their faith like this? so far, hasn't it? What about scenario four? Hello there. Hello. What can I do for you? Um, I'd like to buy a book of first class stamps, please. Yeah, certainly. I'll just get you one. Do you, do you use a lot of stamps, then? Um, yeah, quite a lot. Um, I do eBay and stuff. Oh, so eBay. Something. How do you pay for things on eBay? Um, numerous ways, but quite often use PayPal. PayPal. What kind of card do you use on PayPal? Uh, I've just got a Barclay card. Okay, so I don't know if, if you know about this, but the post office now does a credit card, which has this special insurance on it, so that if you use it on the internet and something goes wrong, you're insured, it's wrong with the products, oh, really? it's frauded. That's very interesting. Um, like what, what else does it have to do? Well, it's got 0% on balance transfers for eight months. So if um, if you've got other credit cards that you've got um, interest payments ticking up on, you can move them across. Um, so it's interest-free on products for, for three months. Um, Sounds very good. The other thing which a lot of people are finding it useful is it, there's no commission if you use it abroad. Oh, really? There's only actually one other credit card in the, um, in the country that you can use abroad for free. Um, oh, right. So a lot of people take it out when they go on holiday. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, could you give me some material about yeah, it? Yeah, certainly. I'll just give you your stamps and okay. take the money. Thank you. I'll put this in the till. And um, I'll just get you some leaflets. Is there anything else I can do for you while I'm up? Um, nothing, that's fine. Okay, okay. thank you. So would you buy a credit card from someone who was interested in you? When we talk to others about our faith, do we respond to what they are saying? sales from this video and um, I've been Dr. Roger McAllister Smythe and you've been wonderful. For the moment, Poodle Pit. Yeah, Dom, hi. So lunch. So I hope you enjoyed either the video or me turning absolutely beetroot coloured <laughs> in the corner there. Uh, so I'm going to ask Emma to come up and bring us our reading.
reading today is from John 4, verses 1 to 42, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus baptising and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus didn't, himself didn't baptise them, his disciples did. So he left Judea to return to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the parcel ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired for the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noon time. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time, because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who I am, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this is a deep well. Where would you get this living water? And besides, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his cattle enjoyed? Jesus replied, people soon become thirsty again after drinking this water. But the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me some of that water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to hold water. Go and get your husband, Jesus replied. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? while we Samaritans claim it to be here at Mount Jerusalem where our ancestors worshipped. Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming when it will be no no longer matter whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know so little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, and it is already here, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for anyone who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah will come, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples arrived. They were astonished to find him talking to a woman, but none of them asked him why he was doing it or where been, what they had been discussing. The woman left her water jar beside the well and went back to the village and told everyone, Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So the people came streaming for the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus to eat. No, he said, I have food you don't know about. Who brought it to him? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God, who sent me and from finishing his work. Do you think the work of harvesting will not begin until the summer ends four months from now? Look around you. Vast fields are ripening all around us and are ready now for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one person plants and someone else harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already done the work, and you will gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay at the village, so he stayed for two days long enough for many of them to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, because we have heard him ourselves, not just because of what you told us. He is indeed the saviour of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I went to a support group for a short-term memory loss the other day, and the host said, um, good evening, you're probably all wondering why you walked into the room. Ba-boom! Did you get it? Um, can you remember what we focused on last Sunday? Not a rhetorical question. Anyone remember? Faith. Well done, Kath. Uh, anything in particular? Sharing our faith. Um, anything more particular? <laughs> Two-minute testimony challenge. Well done, Hilary. Okay. Um, I think we're ready for the PowerPoint. Chris? Yeah, good. Um, the two minute lift challenge. So, I don't know if any of you have tried this, what your life came, was like before you came to faith, what made you make a commitment, and then what your life is like now. Um, and Stuart also went through the five marks of mission. So, because our memory is not what maybe it could be, we'll just very quickly go through these. Uh, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, that's to tell. To teach, baptise and nurture new believers, to, which is to teach. To respond to human need by loving service, to tend, uh, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, to transform. And to strive to save the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Um, and... Uh, which is to treasure, sorry. <laughs> and then uh, he went back to number one uh, mark of mission, which is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And another way of saying that might be sharing your faith. So when we're sharing our faith, that's what we're doing. And there's many different ways of doing it. There's more than one way to skin a cat. So hopefully what we're doing um, through this teaching series is equipping you uh, with things you can pull out of your back pocket when you find yourself in a conversation with someone who is curious or who wants to know or who you just get the feeling uh, is ripe for uh, the, the message. Um, we had a really good PCC away day yesterday and one of the things we did was to pause and consider our faith journey and how many people were involved in it. How many inf people influenced us as we came to faith? Um, and it was quite surprising because when we did pause and think about it, although we can say our testimony in two minutes and wrap it all up quickly, uh, there are a lot of people who influence us throughout our life and uh, who enriched our lives on the journey to a commitment. So you might just like to pause now and have a think for yourself. Who were the influencers in your life uh, that brought you to faith? Uh, and if you're not quite there, who are they now? And as you think about them, you can thank God for them. And it's a worthy exercise to do because each one of us does have a different story to tell. And as we move forward in our program, it's worthwhile just noting that when we share our faith, it isn't really about technique, it's about people. Um, I remember hearing a speaker at Spring Harvest saying many years ago that the most wonderful thing about being in heaven was seeing all the people that you had helped along the way to get there. And that really made me think. Yeah, as uh, Lynn says yesterday, you know, it's not us that brings people to faith. Uh, it's God. Faith is a gift from God. So as we're talking things spiritual, it's always uh, important to remember to pray. Um, that said, uh, we do work with God to make sure that the good news is made known. We're his mouthpiece, aren't we? If no one says it, no one's going to hear it, no one's going to make any sort of a commitment. Yet we often struggle to quite decide what to include and what to leave out this morning. So, this morning, no additional costs, I'm going to offer you this gospel in a nutshell, which is that God made it, uh, Adam broke it, Jesus fixed it. Well. 
actually, if I said that to my friend, they wouldn't know what I was on about. Who's Adam? What's Jesus fixed? Don't know. It doesn't make sense. So my version is that God made the world good. Uh, we human beings have messed it up. Uh, Jesus has fixed it. Uh, he did that on the cross through the cross and resurrection. And as we put our trust and faith in him, we are put right with God. That's it. Just four bullet points there. So you might like to come back and have a look at that. Um, it's a very simple way of sharing our faith without getting um, all fiddled with uh, lots of complicated theology. So now you've got your lift testimony and you've got the gospel in a nutshell. But you may remember that last week I said that one of the things that makes us nervous in sh sharing our faith is our fear of offending somebody. Um, and I, this morning we're going to focus on questions being the, one of the very good ways of engaging with our friends and sharing our faith. And questions are important because people come to a conversation about faith uh, sharing their background, which is a story of their experiences up until that point in time, with beliefs that they've distilled from their life experience so far, and also with some blockages about the Christian faith. And as we take an interest in them and get to know them better, we are more equipped to just share uh, what we know of God and Jesus. So we're going to have a very quick look now at uh, John 4. I wanted the whole of the story read because to read a little bit, you don't get quite the whole overview of, of, the, of what's happened. Um, so we didn't have any other re readings because it was such a long story. Um, it's interesting that it's the Samaritan woman who asks most of the questions, and it's Jesus' replies which sort of um, move up the ante and move the conversation forward until the great reveal when he shares the good news with her that he himself is the long-awaited for Messiah, God's chosen one, God's anointed. Um, and through their conversation, we see backgrounds revealed beliefs expressed and blockages exposed. So the first sort of background we see revealed is when Jesus actually says to the woman, will you give me a drink? Um, Jesus is pushing the boundaries when he asks her this question. Um, she's this stranger who's come to the well at the heat of the day, he's tired, and she immediately responds, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman, why are you asking me for a drink? She might not have said it in that time. <laughs> Why are you asking me for a drink? It's a direct, honest question. And she's asking it because this is not normal behaviour. Jesus is pushing the boundaries of convention. And when we do the same, eyebrows are raised. Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other if they could help it because Samaritans had intermarried with the people around them and Jews despised them for that um, because they viewed them as being impure, that they'd sullied their identity as God's chosen people. And yet they had the same history. They all used the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, uh, as their holy scriptures. Also, in Jesus' day, it was against convention, uh, sorry, convention for men to speak with women in public. It's hard for us to understand that. But I want us to pause here and um, give you something to think about. Are we open to asking folks who are not in our set to do something for us? Jesus has asked her for water. In asking the question, he's asking her to do something for him. Jesus is actually giving her worth. You know, how many times do we do not ask people who are not in our set for something because they're not in our set? And when we do that, we remain exclusive. We've got to reach out to people and ask for their help when we need it, whoever they are. And when we ask people for help, it often makes them feel valued and it deepens the relationship. 
Now, what's interesting is the woman could have just said, OK, and lowered her water jar down the well and got him a drink. But why didn't she? Well, she had this question to ask. She was curious. So she, and Jesus doesn't reply with a straight answer. He doesn't say, I'm thirsty, that's why I want a drink. Uh, and neither does he say, well, I'm the Messiah and I'd like you to give me a drink. He says, if you only knew the gift of, that God has for you and who I am, you would ask me and I would give you living water. So he's asked her for a drink and now he's saying, actually, he is the drink. Um, and he's reeling her curiosity in and building the relationship. The woman takes uh, the bait and shares more of herself. You can't give me water. You've got nothing to put down the well. And then here we go. And in any case, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave, up, uh, gave us this well? So the dialogue has now moved up a level, level and they're talking about belief. And interestingly, it's the woman who hones in on something that both the Jews and the Samaritans have in common, which is their history. And you often find that when you're chatting to people. You know, um, they'll, they'll know something about Christianity and they say, well, you know, this and that, I believe that, you believe that. Jesus replied, People soon, um, become, people soon become thirsty again after drinking this water, but the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. So the woman must really realise that he's not talking about water anymore, but she chooses not to hear it, and she takes what he says at face value, she wants a debate. And I'm sure we all know people like that. Oh, please, sir, the woman says, give me some of that water, then I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to haul the water. Well, is she mocking? Is she deliberately misunderstanding? Is she serious? I don't know what the tone of her voice is. I think she's mocking. And the conversation, however, goes deeper still. And Jesus does give her water, but it isn't in a way that she recognises. Because the water he gives her is truth. He knows everything about her, and he now lets her know. Go and get your husband, he says. I don't have a husband, she answers. He says... You're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. So in commentaries, they often think the woman is a, a promiscuous woman, uh, a bit of a floozy. Um, but we have to remember that in those days, women were men's property and men could divorce women at, just by signing a piece of paper. Um, also, there was the Levite marriage where a brother would marry um, the widow of his, his brother after he would died. So not necessarily the case. But the striking thing to note here is that Jesus has this gift of discernment, the word of knowledge, uh, which we might all take for granted. You know, on the other side of the cross, well, he's God, isn't he? <laughs> but... Um, when you have a faith conversation, don't forget to pray, to rely on God, to lean on him, and even ask him for a revelation which will increase the faith of the person that you're speaking with. It's keeping out an ear for what God might say to you. It could be a word or a picture as you're in, engaged in conversation. The woman goes on, you must be a prophet. And then uh, that leads to uh, the realms of blockage. So tell me now, why is it that Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? So she's saying, you know, I'm a Samaritan. Uh, this is where we worship, and it's okay. It's where our ancestors were. So she's confident of her identity as a Samaritan. Maybe she's even a little bit nationalistic. 
And I'd say she's almost aggressively challenging Jesus now, simply, why? Because he's a Jew, which naturally means that Jerusalem is the only place of worship for him. She's already talked about Jacob's well, and now she's saying Mount Gerizim is just as good as Jerusalem. Uh, she's sharing her belief, and she's also revealing a blockage. So Jesus takes this opportunity to lay everything out before the woman, and he doesn't pull his punches this time. He says, believe me, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. Um, and he goes on, the Father is looking for anyone who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's saying, don't get hung up about buildings. The time's coming when where we worship is immaterial. What's important is we worship in spirit and in truth. He's giving the woman living water. Is she drinking? I think she is. She doesn't want to concede, but she still wants to say she's better than him. I know the Messiah will come, the one who's Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. So she rushes off to tell the villagers. The villagers come and she asks them uh, a question. Come and meet the man who knows everything about me. Is he the Messiah? So they've got that question in their mind too. Uh, so sometimes I think we can fall into the trap of thinking that questions are somehow um, expressing doubt or belief or ignorance or perhaps in the context of sharing our faith we might think that they're a little bit intrusive but questions are a real tool to use to unlock spiritual awareness and find out where people are coming from. Um, so we're 2,000 years on now and our context may be a little bit different but I just want to share with you some examples of questions that we might ask people when we're in a sort of faith conversation. Um, but before we do that, just a reminder really that came out of Phil's um, wonderful video uh, that we're not to be judgmental, we're not to be pushy, uh, that we are to believe in what we're saying and it's good to be curious and honest and open when we're talking. And then also to remember that none of us will bring anyone to faith, that's what God does and that's why it's so important that we pray. So these questions are not meant to be prescriptive, they're just examples. And um, these, these, this, this is not my own work. These questions come from CPAS, the Church Pastoral Aid Society, so they're suggestions. Have you ever had a spiritual experience? What was it like? You know, often we're so keen to share our own spiritual experience, we might not ask somebody what theirs is, and that's a good starter for 10. Uh, would you describe yourself as near or far from God? Sometimes I say, are you turning, certainly with baptism prep, are you facing God or are you turning away from him? The, the direction of travel really matters. Um, what do you think God is like? Who do you think Jesus was and why do you think that? And all those questions are helping us get an understanding of where somebody is coming from, their background. And then um, in terms of uh, belief, we might ask somebody, what do they want in life? What, what do they think makes them happy, fulfilled or accepted? And sometimes people say things and uh, it's hard to challenge them. So really, do you really think that? Like explain why you think this or that. Um, and why you think that this or that and how do you know this or that like prove it to me uh, so we try and find out what folks believe believe and then um, blockages so blockages is a big one isn't it and I think a lot of people have some big blockages when it comes to faith if you had one question to ask Jesus what would it be and I think 10 to 1 it would be why is there suffering in the world 
And even as I say it, I want to cry because I don't like suffering. What is the biggest blockage for you when it comes to faith? You know, what's happened? Like, why, why, why can't you believe? Is there any reason why you couldn't ask for Jesus' forgiveness and his leadership of your life right now? So some people will say, yes, they believe it all. And then you say, well, have you ever really made a commitment? Has your life really changed because of what you say you believe? And uh, at that point, you know, it's, we're all on a journey. But when you make a commitment, that's uh, pretty important because your life comes under uh, God's authority in a way. So... I thank you for listening. I would encourage us all to be bold and courageous. Not to forget the two-minute testimony, to practice it with your friends and uh, folks you trust before you met, share it with someone you're not so knowledgeable of. Um, don't forget the gospel in a nutshell. And don't forget to ask questions. And finally, in all of it, remember to pray. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so we're going to respond to what Jill has been sharing with us in song as we're going to stand and sing our next song, One Shall Tell Another, which is number 439 if you're looking in the books. 439. said uh, it's really important that we start with prayer and that's what we're going to do now we're going to uh, have a time of prayer um, so if you'd like to close your eyes we're going to do it you might not have prayed this way before but we're going to use the part of our brain that we use to imagine uh, so I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and we're going to be thinking about a number of individuals uh, this morning and I'm going to ask you to kind of bring them before God by imagining their faces so if you close your eyes uh, I'd like you to think of someone who you know and who you hope uh, will one day come to know and love Jesus. And as we bring them before God, I'm going to ask you to try and imagine their faces. Can you picture uh, the top of their head? Uh, have they got hair there? What colour is it? 
And can you imagine their smile? What do they look like when they smile? Do you might know their eye colour. <laughs> So Lord God, we lift up to you now these people who we are picturing in our minds now. We ask that you be at work in their lives. We don't know what they need, we don't know what's in their minds, but you do. You know them, Lord. So we offer them to you now and ask you to work in them. So we turn now uh, to picture someone else we know and love. And this is someone we know and love who's hurting at the moment, whether that's spiritually, whether that's physically, emotionally, or mentally. We're going to picture them and bring them before God. And as before, you might want to uh, try and picture their hair, the top of their head. You might want to picture them smiling. You might want to try and picture their eyes. So Lord God, we lift before you now these people we are picturing, these people that are hurting. We ask that your healing hand may be upon them and you may give them what they need today. So we turn now to pray for our church community. And I'd like you to picture one person uh, from St. Catherine's who volunteers at St. Catherine's. Uh, it can't be anyone who's paid to be here, so it can't be Jill or I. Um, I'd like you to picture someone at St. Catherine's who volunteers and has a ministry here. And again, uh, picture their hair, picture their smile, and picture their eyes. Lord God, we thank you so much for everyone who gives up their time to serve you here through the work of St. Catharines. And we lift up to you particularly now these people who we have been picturing. We pray that you may bless them in their ministry to you this day. We turn now to think outside um, of our world, uh, our world, our internal world, and we think outside. So I'd like you to picture a world leader who you think uh, could do with some prayer this morning. And as you picture this world leader, think about their hair, think about their smile, and think about their eyes. Lord God, we bring before you now uh, the leader that we have been picturing. We pray that you will give them your wisdom, uh, your humility, your courage, and your strength as they lead. And finally, we turn to pray for ourselves. Um, so you see if you can <laughs> imagine what your face looks like. Uh, picture your hair if you have it. We picture what you look like when you smile. 
Do you know what colour your eyes are? God does. Lord God, you know us better than we know ourselves. We pray that you will bless us and you will give us uh, what you know we need. So Lord, we commit all the people who we have been imagining and picturing this morning uh, to your loving care. May you bless them and keep them. In the precious name of your Son, our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we come to our affirmation of faith, where we say the faith that we hope that first person we were picturing might come to know. So let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The great thing about being a church is that we're in this together. So when it comes to sharing our faith, we're not alone in that, and we can work together. And everything we do as a church is about growing God's kingdom. Uh, and the notices might not sound like the most spiritual part of the service, but in some ways they are, uh, because... They're how we work together um, as a church to share our faith. Um, so we're going to share the notices now. Um, I've got two to share. Um, I'll share one of them and then I'll open the floor if anyone else has anything to share. Uh, but the first thing I want to tell you about is Cats Cartoon Club, uh, which is launching physically on the 2nd of October at 4 o'clock in the church hall. Cats Cartoon Club, uh, the idea is that we get people together to watch a cartoon on the big screen in the hall and it's going to be a family friendly uh, film so hopefully it will be attractive to children to adults alike we can come together we can enjoy a film together and then we'll have a little bible thought based on the film um, and a little craft together so on the 2nd of october at four o'clock we'll be watching luca in the other in, in the hall luca if you've not come across it it's, it's a beautiful film actually it's set in the italian riviera so you can pretend you're still on holiday uh, and it's about a sea monster who wants to kind of live on the land uh, with the village there. It's such a really charming film, so I would encourage you to come along if that sounds attractive. If it's not your bag, maybe have a think if there's someone you know who might enjoy that, that you might like to tell about it. There are some flyers um, as you kind of go out of church that we've, by the door to the kitchen, we've got a kind of a flyer dispenser and there are some flyers about Cat's Cartoon on there, so do take one and share it if you know anyone who'd be interested in that. Um, has anybody else got any notices that they would like to share? Okay. Um, so the magazines are out today. I know that some of you are concerned about the waste of paper because they're in envelopes. I started that in the uh, first phase of lockdown for COVID safety. It's much easier if they're in an envelope, so I can stick a label on for those who have subscribed. If you can't reuse the envelope your magazine is in, by all means bring it back and I'll put, put a new stick on it next time for someone else. So um, most of us can use envelopes anyway, but if you can't, just bring it back and I'll reuse it. Joe, were you going to... I've just got a little message from Betty Want, who I saw just over a week ago now. We were down in Cornwall and we visited her. Um, and she's doing really, really well, looking very well, very busy, and her home is lovely. She's done a lot of work to it, and her garden, as you imagine, those who know her. Um, but she wanted me to put this card on the notice board particularly, but it's not easy to pin it up so that you can read it. <laughs> so it's got a picture of St. Michael's Mount on it. But anyway, so I'll read out what she says. To my sisters and brothers at St. Catherine's, this comes all the way up from the West Country. 
The Mount is just 10 minutes from where I live and it is truly amazing in all weathers. My thoughts and prayers are with you, with you all, and I will never forget the fellowship and friendship that St. Catherine's gave me. I pray that God will bless, guide, and protect you all. With my love, best wishes, Betty. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Um, I just wanted to say, I don't know if any, any of you listen to the radio in the evening, late at night, uh, Great Lives with Matthew Paris on Friday night at 11 o'clock on Radio 4 was St. Catherine of Siena. Quite interesting, but of course I went to sleep. <laughs> but I did catch up on iPlayer with it. It was quite interesting if anybody wants to listen. I think you can hear it on BBC Sounds rather than iPlayer, can't you? <laughs> uh, spectacle case with spectacles. Nobody want it? It was left down more or less where um, Heather Addison is at the back there last week. I'll leave it there. Um, I will be very quick, but I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for all the amazing support that I received from everyone within the church for the uh, rather long walk that I went on just over a week ago. So I think I told you it was going to be 25 miles. We did make it. Um, it took 13 and a quarter hours, which is a very long time to be on your feet. But all the kind of messages of kind of congratulations and wishing me well before the walk were really helpful, particularly on the second mountain where I'd really had enough but actually reflecting back on all the kind wishes that I'd had from you guys has really helped. So thank you. I will update you when we finally know how much we've raised. I think I've had some more donations this morning, so I think I'm now just over £900, which is um, amazing. So thank you ever so much for the support. I just want to say that we had some baptisms last Sunday, uh, two, um, and they were well attended. But we do need more helpers to help, uh, help with that, if you could. They were great fun. I'm not sure when the next one is, though. So next week. There you go. Sorry, we need to draw attention to next week being um, our harvest service. And we thought we'd have a spud lunch afterwards. Um, so we'll just do it, and everyone is welcome to stay. Do bring tins. Uh, you can bring them through the week. And... Um, Maureen and the ladies will decorate the windows and everything with all the food, and you can bring it on the service as well. But the main theme will be send a cow, so financial di donations to send a cow. Um, yes, but uh, lunch afterwards, spud lunch, chilli, cheese, tuna, and something else. Anyway, it'll be fine. Um, but also, the baptism, which was arranged before we decided on the lunch, will be in here at 12. It's only a small ba baptism, but, uh, you know, we'll be coordinating that. Uh, and it's Rebecca who has started coming here. It's her birthday today. So we won't use time to sing to you, which might be embarrassing. Maybe while we're having tea and coffee afterwards. Happy birthday, Rebecca. It's lovely to have you with us. Yeah. Thank you. Now, we don't actually have the peace in this liturgy, uh, but even so, let's just take a moment to uh, turn around and smile at each other through our masks and maybe wave as well while I sit up, set up the table.
as is our current custom, I will drink the wine on behalf of everyone and then Jill and I will bring uh, the wafers to people in their tables, in their tables, in their chairs. So lift up your hearts, you lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these heavenly gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your church throughout the whole world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voices to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. So let us pray with confidence as our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Let us share this special meal together. Let us remember Jesus died for us and rose again and is with us now. So let's draw close to God and each other around God's table.
for bringing us together in love. Thank you for feeding us with your very self. Thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you for sending us out in your love to change the world. Thank you. So we now stand for our final song, Tell All the World of Jesus. to the ending and we end by giving everything over to the cross so all our problems we send to the cross of Christ all our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ all the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ all our hope we set on the risen Christ so the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.